Well, more Americans than ever are willing to get their groceries online. Thanks to the pandemic, more of us are used to having the experience of actually doing it. But with that new high demand comes higher expectations. It used to be delivery tomorrow, then it became delivery today, then delivery in an hour. Now it's delivery in 15 minutes. And that is from and that is coming now from a crop of new instant convenience players. And today we're going to meet one of them. I'm talking with Dennis Levine. Dennis is the VP of expansion at Joker. This is Where We Buy. It's the show where we talk with retail experts and we visit the places where we buy. My name is James Cook. I research retail and real estate for JLL. I am joining you live from my home office in Indiana. (laughs) We're recording live on the internet this week. People are watching live on YouTube. We're on Twitter. We're on LinkedIn on the JLL Retail Showcase page. Uh, If you are watching live and you have a question, Type it into the chat and uh, we will get to as many questions at the end of the show as we can. So like I said, we're going to be hearing from Dennis Levine. He's the VP of expansion at Joker. But before Dennis, I've got another expert I want to talk to. And his name is Gino Corradini. Welcome, Gino. James, how are you, man? Good to see you. Yeah, it looks like you're rocking your home office as well. I am rocking the home office. We're in the middle of transitioning to a new wonderful office in Dallas and uh, got a couple of days, of, I would say downtime, but not quite downtime, but certainly working from home. Awesome. So Gino, you are uh, the retail man- a retail managing director at JLL. You have a national view of the retail scene. It seems like we've had this, you know, I, I, I mentioned it at the top, this national transition from long delivery to now instant delivery. What do you, from your point of view, what's that transition been like for retailers? It's been exciting on one hand, uh, but it's also been quite a challenge because of the infrastructure. You know, many uh, retail brick and mortar locations were not designed to have a staging area. If you look at some of the home improvement locations, you know, they've got piles and piles of, of lumber and other hardware stacked up waiting for customers to come pick things up. Or if you go to the grocery store, it's changed the parking lot, right? You've got people that are driving to pick up their groceries, whether it's the actual end end user, the customer, or it's some other delivery service that needs a place to park. Uh, You go into some groceries now and they have all these shoppers. Um, So they're having to accommodate and evolve. It's, It's great because it's creating this new demand, as we'll talk about later, in ways of getting items that you know used to be the convenience store was actually convenient and now some could argue that the convenience store is not convenient enough <laughs> i need it and i need it now yeah i mean come on i gotta walk there what i gotta drive there come on bring it to me <laughs> well right. gino you know apart from being a part of jll you've also been the head of real estate at a number of retailers what i mean is something like instant delivery even, was that even on the radar of a traditional retailer? No, not really. Um, particularly if you look at like general merchandise, uh, whether it's soft goods uh, and so forth, you would always try to build a piece of property or develop a store to be appealing to the customer because the customer, you wanted them to come in, you wanted them to have that shopping experience. And it seems now more than ever, particularly with commodity type items, if it's going to be the same, whether you go pick it up or somebody brings it to you, then bring it to me. Um, right. But they've got to be competitive too, right? Because if the customer's not driving to those retail establishments, they've got to figure out a, a means of getting that product to them a different way. And so we're seeing a lot of different 
uh, areas of retail evolve into satisfying the demanding customer. And that's what it boils down to. Whatever the customers demand, the retailers have to conform to. And that's what they're doing. And that's a challenge. It's a disruption, but many are doing it better than others. And when we think about how COVID has impacted this, you know, there's been online ordering for years, but COVID has simply accelerated all of those changes to the retail uh, environment. And so that's what we're experiencing now. And it's an exciting time to see new brands, new concepts come to market. Yeah, absolutely. And I imagine there's a cost component there too. I mean, some consumers are willing to pay extra for uh, fast delivery, but others probably expect it to be a part of the cost of, you know, the goods, right? That's right. Some, some deliveries are charging the consumer um, a, a fee to deliver and consumers are saying that's okay. On the flip side, you know, many to be competitive retailers are sometimes not charging to be competitive, not charging for delivery and it's margin dilutive, right? You're paying for this real estate. You're already paying distribution costs to bring product to the store. Now you got to go from the store to the customer. It's like, how many times are we going to move this product? So balancing the supply chain is also a challenge. Absolutely. All right. Well, that's a good setup. That's going to lead us into the specifics of today. We're talking about Joker. So Gino, uh, you're okay to hang around. We're going to bring you back in later, sure. but we'll say, okay, great. So we're going to say goodbye to Gino for now. And we're going to be joined by Dennis Levine with Joker. Welcome, Dennis. Thanks, James. Super excited to be here today. Yeah, I'm really glad to have you too because, um, you know, we start big picture, but I love specifics. So you're the VP of expansion at Joker. You're wearing your Joker shirt. Now, why are you wearing that shirt today? I mean, we like to rep the colors, but, uh, you know, this morning I actually was in the, in the hubs delivering some orders, you know, getting back and, uh, talking to customers, experience the, the product firsthand. You know, I think, I think more so than, than sitting in office. Uh, I'm a consumer of the product that we're offering and, and, and I'm an offer of that product. And it's always good back to, 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 to get in, in, in the hubs, you know, get, get with the employees, get with the customers and really get that, that firsthand feedback. Yeah. I mean, I love it. So you were, you know, they, you know, you get in an order and you got to gather it, jump on a bike and ride out to somewhere in Manhattan. Is that how it works? Yeah, so you know today, you know Joker's Joker's live in in, in, in countries across Europe, Latin America, and, and here in North America. As you think about the U.S. Fo U.S. focus, you know today live in Manhattan, in the Bronx, and the Queens, uh, and it are, all all the depends on being able to serve that local community. Uh, and so you know our promise today is is fifteen minutes or less, and and we do that by being you know ingrained in the local community, ingrained in the local environment, and that means that we have to be down the block for us to. You know, deliver deliver your groceries and more in in, in in 15 minutes or less on on an electric bike or an electric scooter what's the most common thing people order I, I would think it would be like milk or something yeah you know so it really depends and, and it really goes neighborhood by neighborhood you know we don't take this national view this global view of assortment and and products and offerings you know what sells in one part of the city is completely different than, than what sells in the other you know some areas really skew towards these local products these local heroes uh, that are ingrained in that local community. But on the other side of town, you know, folks might not know about that. And so, you know, certainly the, the, the grocery items, the, you know, the staples, the avocados are, 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 are big sellers, but, you know, also the, the household items, you know, the paper towels, uh, you know, sell well. And then, you know, even cross categories, you get into pet supplies and, and, and baby food, you know, we're much more than snacks and chips and groceries. We're, we're really trying to, to, to focus on what are the products you need and, and when do you need it? And, and I think that's the innovation that we see, you know, a continuous trend over time from offline to online, online to more rapid, rapid to even more rapid, you know, and then us coming into the market to offer stuff and in, uh, uh, in the moment, you know, when you need it. Yeah. The next step is you're going to figure out stuff that I need before I know I need it. You know, a little brain well, implant. How, how do you say that? Because, you know, that's, that's where the, where, where, where we really pride ourselves on, on, on innovating, on understanding what it is that you want and, and using data to, to not just offer you a broad assortment. You know, if you go into your grocery store, you know, there might be some target segments that they might be going after, but it's a broad assortment tailored to everyone. And that's partially why they need so much space is because they need to have all this variety. But if I know James that, you know, every Tuesday you order your almond milk, or if I know that, you know, there's this new product release that that's going to be really, really pertinent to you. We can know that maybe in the morning on Tuesdays, we don't, we don't carry that milk, but by the afternoon, 
we're having our continuous drops come and stocking that item. And, and only through that personalization, that localization, tailoring that assortment, you know, allows us to have that limited footprint, which then enables the speed, which, you know, really is, is one of the key features of, of, of the offering. So Joker uh, closed on a 170 million Series A round in July. Uh, your, am I right? Your tagline is your favorite products delivered in 15 minutes, or I think that's something I saw on the website. So it's really about this instant convenience delivery. What? Uh, let's get into the real estate of this. What is the strategy that you have to have in order to meet that tight order deadline? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the fundraising. I think an amazing team, and that's you know our Joker team, and then the supporters from from our investors, and really with a with an A list roster of investors that are you know so that are that are, that are backing us in this journey. And as you think about the real estate strategy, you know, it really comes down to leveraging data and being local in the community. And so we've gone through an exercise where we've mapped the entire globe into these rectangles of you know a couple hundred meters and using data, using analytics to get socio economic data, whether it's population, food spend, average age, demographics, all of these different factors that come in and plug into our tools to say, this is not just a city, this is not just a neighborhood, but a sub neighborhood that we really want to be in and that we want to serve. And, and that really drives the real estate strategy because to be honest with you, we take retail spaces that, that look like a white box. You know, they're three to 4,000 square feet. They have, you know, at grade that they, they, you know, ideally don't have any columns or, or anything, you know, anything too particular, but, you know, we really let the, localization of the product and the offering drive where we need to be and you know fortunately for us we take spaces that you know they don't need to have foot traffic they don't need to have frontage that traditional real retailers are paying premiums for and so we have spaces that you know were vacant because of covid but also we're taking spaces that have been vacant for years and years and years because they might be on a side street that aren't attractive to a traditional retailer and so we can come in and reactivate a neighborhood reactivate a community you know and not just be an amenity for the folks that live within a mile of our, our store but also you know, we see loud and clear that the folks that live upstairs from our buildings and our landlord partners, you know, are saying, you know, Joker's Joker's and many, not just to the community, but to, 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 to the building as well. And so you'll, it, it's not necessarily dark retail space. It could really be any space anywhere, as long as it's in the right spot. Yeah. You know, obviously we have our parameters we need, you know, we need the things that, that work for us. You know, we've, we're such a young company that, that speed to market is quite important. So, you know, the shape of the space, the condition of the space is important. You know, the consideration of, you know, the access for, for bringing deliveries in and out and bringing the bikes in and out, uh, the electric bikes is, is important. And then obviously, you know, there's no retailer out there that's not sensitive to, you know, prices and, 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 and things of that nature. So you know, I don't want to oversimplify it to say that, you know, neighborhoods is all that we care about, but it really is driven from an analytical approach to say, we want to be in this neighborhood really doing our, you know, social de demographic research to say, what is it that will re resonate for these customers uh, and then be centrally located because to deliver in 15 minutes or less, we have to be within a mile. And if you're, you know, if you're along the river, all of a sudden you can only go one direction out of two. Uh, and so being centrally located, uh, you know, in that community, I think is, 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 is critical to us. Now, um, the electric bikes that have to access the store, is this your own fleet or are these independent contractors on their own bikes? How does that work? Yeah. So I think one of the really, really important things to us is at Joker is to, to really be a team. Um, and that means all the way up from our CEO and global co-founder, all the way down to, you know, the pickers and the riders and the inventory associates that, that work in our hubs. Um, and so they're all employed uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they're part of our team. And so, you know, we spend time in, in the facilities, they come to the office, we work well together and having them part of the community, you know, not only enables us to have an efficient operation, but also, you know, builds that connectivity when we roll out a new product or a new feature or new technology or new algorithm that then they say, okay, I'm really invested in this company and they're building it together with us. You know, it's not just the corporate office that's, you know, sitting up in a tower and, and pushing stuff down to, to gig employees that have harsh conditions and no bathrooms and some of the things that you read about in the press. I, I love that. I love that you said that because you're absolutely right. Um, it's got to be difficult to be a gig employee on an electric bike and not even have a place, you know, to go to the bathroom. I mean, <laughs> um, so we, we talked about New York. Um, give us a sense of tar other expansion markets, countries, cities for Joker. Yeah, we took we took a unique approach with Joker and, and, and basically launched, you know, across three continents, seven countries all at once, you know, across Europe and, and, and South America and, and, and North America, as I mentioned. You know, we have a strong presence here in, in New York City in the U.S. 
you know, expanding to a number of cities soon. You know, you'll you'll see Boston coming up, you know, down down the pipeline and, and, and others, uh, you know, shortly thereafter. So, you know, really excited about the footprint. I think, you know, for us, it's it's continuing to build, continuing to grow and to continue to bring this, this amazing experience uh, to more and more people around the world. That's great. So when you're looking at a city, um, are you blanketing the city with Joker locations or are you just targeting certain neighborhoods or certain types of neighbor neighborhoods? Yeah, I think I think you go back to the core question that, that we ask ourselves, and that's, you know, what do customers need and when do they need it? And that's the question that's been you know governing retail since the existence of, of consumer spending. And, uh, you know, that's what the, the retailers are trying to figure out. You know, that shift has, has, has seen a wave moving online. You know, when when do you want stuff? Where do you need it? Uh, and so we really, you, you know, we looked to solve that question for our consumers. And in some places, you know, that that when question, the infrastructure might not be in place uh, to, to deliver at the speed that we might do with the density in New York City. Uh, and so I think there's a number of factors that we look to, but it all comes back to the consumer being super consumer focused to say, what is it really that the consumer wants and needs? Uh, and and when, when is it that they need those goods? Gotcha. Are there certain metrics that you look at around you know, age or, you know, lifestyle groups or anything like that? For sure. And we have our, you know, our segmentation, but what we like to do is not necessarily rely on, you know, a couple of archetypes. It's, it's very common to say, you know, the, the young parents or the, you know, the, the, the single mother or the kid just out of college. And, you know, what, what we're doing is really, you know, leveraging data to say, this is not just a broad categorization of, of personas, but to say, you know, based on the way that you behave, um, these are the things that are relevant to you and personalize your experience. And so, you know, data is, 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 core, is critical to, to making sure that we're able to have that personalized offering, which is really the core, core of what we do. And, and by having that personalized offering, you know, not only do you benefit as a consumer, but we can carry less inventory, have less waste, have our supply chain ship things, you know, fewer times around the world, deliver to you on a sustainable, eco-friendly e-bike. Uh, and it's more so than, than you getting your groceries. It's also you know, doing, doing a benefit for, for, for the world and for the local community. Yeah. How big is the delivery area? How, how far do those bikes go out? Yeah. So, you know, we, again, we, you know, we use data to, to, to determine where that is. So there's no one size fits all, but given that we have to get there in 15 minutes or less, typically it's around one mile, you know, in New York city, 20, 20 city blocks that, you know, you can comfortably get uh, with time when the order comes in, it gets picked and packed and then handed off to one of our, our riders, our delivery folk that, you know, then ride. And, and typically that radius is around one mile, but it depends neighborhood by neighborhood. It depends on, you know, the traffic patterns in that neighborhood. It depends on a number of factors that, you know, we, 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 we tailor for every hub that we open. Yeah. So Joker is new. You launched over the summer. Um, what's that journey been like? I mean, there's a lot of, like, we kind of alluded to this. We'll get into it more. There's other um, kind of instant convenience players out there. Have you seen competition for the same space? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, we can touch on it in a bit in the competitive landscape, but it's been it's been an amazing ride. You know, I think one of the cool things about building a company is the feedback loops aren't, you know, one to two years, they're not one to two months, they're not one to two weeks, but they're one to two days. Um, and, you know, progressively over, over the last weeks and months, you know, building building this business together with the rest of the team, you know, there's, there's things that we're doing now and there's things that we will be doing next week that, were unimaginable weeks ago. And I think that's the part that's really exciting. And, you know, that becomes even more tangible when you go and you, you read the customer reviews and you call up customers and you deliver to customers and you, you talk to friends and you see Joker in the streets. Um, you know, that's the most rewarding part. You know, when you see this thing that you're you know working hard to build, um, you know, come to fruition. And, and that's the cool part for me. And the expansion piece is, you know, walking up and down the streets of Manhattan where, you know, I think there's probably over a thousand sites that I visited myself. Uh, to, to find our locations. And, you know, now some of them get released, some of them, you know, other folks are taking in, some are vacant. And, you know, you just have this retail map of the city that, uh, you know, is, is pretty cool to look back on and, and, and have. Do you have to educate um, yeah. landlords at all about, you know, who you are or they kind of know, know the concept at this point? Yeah, there's, 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 a, range, there's a full range, you know. And so uh, a lot of landlords see the change that's happening in the world and understand the value proposition, the benefit. You know, there's some landlords that are a bit more old school where it takes a little bit more coaching and, 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 and education and, you know, visiting the operation, talking to other landlords, you know, and then some landlords, you know, their space has been vacant for, for a while and they, you know, want a certain type of tenant or a certain type of rents and maybe that's not the right fit for Joker. And so, you know, across the board, we've, we've been able to find the, the locations, the neighborhoods that, 
that we've been targeting. And we have you know, some amazing landlord partners that you know, not only are excited to lease the space to us, but then are actually advocates to other landlords and other tenants you know, are advertising on their flyers saying, you know, rent, a, rent an apartment in my building because Joker is downstairs. Uh, and and you know, I think that was a tipping point for me to really see Joker as an amenity uh, you know, rather than this you know, dark warehouse that you know, sometimes get misconstrued in, uh, in some of the narratives. Yeah, it's almost like you've got room service in your apartment building, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and great. No, no windows, no delivery fees. You know, I think, you know, it's 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 convenient to go around to the corner store or to the bodega, but there's nothing more convenient to having something delivered to your to to your you know to your couch. Yeah. Well, one thing I, I wanted to circle back on is you kind of talked about this idea of sustainability. You know, you've got the electron, the the e-bikes. I mean, is that a part of why you think like like is that a, a real value proposition for Joker? Yeah, and I think you know, James, the e-bikes are important because we're taking cars off the road uh, and reducing emissions that way. But I think when you think about the long term, where we'll have more impact on the sustainability front, and you know, this goes beyond just you know, having a, 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 an environmental lens and a, and a nice to have, you know, really, really gets ingrained in our business model where, you know, we're, we're about being local, we're being about um, serving the products that you need and reducing waste. And if you think about, you know, the average retail good, whether that's groceries or a t-shirt or whatnot, the number of times it circles the globe before it gets to you uh, is truly astounding. Uh, and so if we can really tailor this local assortment with only the goods that you need, you know, we can reduce emissions, not just on that last mile piece, but also throughout the entire supply chain, um, which, you know, I think is really exciting to you know, create a new, new generation that, you know, these legacy organizations that have big systems and big, you know, legacy warehouses and infrastructure, you know, might not be nimble enough to, uh, to execute on. Yeah. All right. Well, Dennis, let's, uh, let's return to Gino and, and get into a bit of group discussion. We're going to add back in Gino Corradini. Welcome back, Gino. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. <laughs> and uh, if you are watching live on YouTube or LinkedIn, you can type in a question in the chat and uh, we'll get to as many questions as we can. Um, while you're all doing that, uh, Dennis, I've got another question for you. And we kind of alluded to this. There are m multiple players, Gorillas, GoPuff, some others that I'm blanking on at the moment. <laughs> um, how do you differentiate yourself in this uh, crowd? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. And, and, and there's a few, you know, main aspects that we really, you know, pride ourselves on. And the first one, you know, isn't necessarily inherent to us. And, and Gino actually hinted towards it, you know, in his opening remarks, but there's just a massive shift to online. If you think about the vast majority of retail today, it's happening offline and that's moving online at a growing, at a growing rate. And, you know, COVID was, was certainly a massive accelerant. And so, you know, there's just such a demand for online that there's almost just not enough players. And so having another player in the space, you know, is a net benefit from, for the ecosystem for consumers, you know, because of these huge tailwinds online. I think the second piece is, is the personalization, right? And James, we talked a bit about it, but having an air of individualism to say, I want things shown to me that are relevant to me, the things that I want to buy, you know, it's personalized. You think about social commerce, you think of game engagement, really personalize at a granular level. I think that's one of the ways that we really set ourselves apart is, you know, building this personalized shopping experience built on data, built on personalization. And, and I think that's one, one, one area we set ourselves apart. You know, we talked about the 15 minutes, you know, speed is a game changer, right? Why wait two days? You mentioned it, you know, two days, you know, one day, eight hours, two hours, you can get in 15 minutes. And, you know, we're all about in the moment and celebrating life and not waiting around for, you know, a scheduled delivery window. So, you know, I think speed is really a game changer for, for us. And then, you know, I think, when we think about the last two about democratization of supply and, and, and sustainability, we touched on it, but having those local products, having those local vendors, having the neighborhood bake shop, having, you know, the local coffee roaster available on, on the platform, you know, these are the products that people know and love and, and, and really are ingrained in the community. And those aren't offered by, you know, the major retailers carrying the major CPGs. And, you know, and on the last piece, the sustainability focus, you know, I, I don't see a ton of people really walking the walk. You know, and we're, we're not there yet. You know, this is an ambition. We're getting there, but, you know, having that part, part of our core. And so when you, when you put together the shift to online, the personalization, the speed, you know, the localization and the sustainability, I think that's a, a super compelling value for that proposition for, for any consumer that's in our uh, delivery zones. I forgot if I asked you this. Now, do you charge a separate delivery fee or is it just baked in to the price of the goods? Yeah. And so for now, you know, there's no delivery fee and, and, and there's no order minimums, uh, which I think is really exciting for consumers. And, 
you know, because we can vertically integrate and source directly from not just the CPGs, but also local, mm -hmm. local vendors, local producers, local farmers, um, you know, by sourcing directly to, to our hubs, um, you know, we are able to make, you know, a, a decent sized gross margin on that product, which we can then, you know, pass through to the consumer. And, you know, as you're wasting less goods, you know, then again, you have more margin to play with to offer this really attractive uh, value proposition for, for the customer. Gotcha. All right. Well, I've got a question for both of you, but I'm going to start with Gino. Um, this demand for sort of these micro fulfillment locations, if you'll call them for hyper local delivery, uh, it seems like there's a lot of demand out there. Are you, Gino, seeing a race to lease these spaces? There absolutely is a race, particularly where you've got a lot of these operators, the different brands and one or two major markets. There's, there's definitely a race. Uh, there's also an education process, and I think the education process, not only at the landlord and property owner level, but also at the local municipality, because what you can see very quickly as we look to open uh, micro fulfillment type operations in retail shopping centers, sometimes you'll be in a particular market where that will be viewed as more of an industrial type play and not a retail play. And so that poses some challenges. And so we see that some municipalities are saying, well, if this is kind of what, you know, retail's morphing towards, uh, maybe a change in use is, is acceptable. Others were saying, ah, that's really got to be kind of out more in the light industrial type areas. I think it's different in the major metro markets. I've seen some of these micro fulfillment operators uh, being closed to the public so they don't let customers come in and shop, which is also sometimes a red flag depending on the market. And then some operators have said, well, if we have just a little kiosk at the front door, we can kind of skirt around that uh, requirement. So there are some challenges. There's a lot of demand. Retail is on fire with a lot of new concepts. Uh, restaurants are coming back with a vengeance, new restaurants as well. So it's a very uh, competitive market out there for sure. Dennis, what are you seeing from that standpoint? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, and I think from our perspective, you know, we have those similar discussions with different municipalities around, you know, ensuring that that we are that, you know, retail use, you know, we're serving directly to consumers in the local community, giving them local goods and services. And so, you know, that 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 in my eyes is, is, is as clear as retail as you can get. But it takes that conversation sometimes to make sure that we're on the same page with, you know, the different municipalities that we go to in terms of the spaces. You know, when we started this journey back earlier this year, you know, the team was looking around and. Um, you know, coming out of COVID, there was more supply. And, and I don't think that's necessarily specific. You know, Gino, you mentioned it, you know, not necessarily specific to this category. You know, rent, restaurant spaces here in New York are, are flying off the shelf and, and you can't you can't get one anywhere, you know. But 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 this type of use that, you know, James, we spoke to earlier, um, you know, a use that was maybe not necessarily uh, the most uh, appreciated, you know, now there is more than that. Um, and certainly now there's, you know, an increased pressure uh, just on the supply base to, uh, you know, to fulfill all of the, the, the growth and demand. And I think, you know, it's really being pulled by the consumer. The consumer is demanding it. So there's players coming into the space uh, and, and, and that has a trickle down effect into the retail, into the, into the real estate. Dennis, do you see um, kind of a crystal ball question here? There's so many operators, as you all both have discussed earlier, Gorillas, Fridge No More, Joker, Foxtrot. Um, is this such a wide open space that we can have eight to 10 to 12 operators and there only be a slight difference between them and they can still coexist or is this guys if you're not uber or lyft forget about the transportation space does that make yeah. sense yeah no and i think it's i think it's a great question and you know even in each of those examples you named it's you know slightly nuanced in terms of what segment they're going after what type of category what type of, what type of goods they're offering and you know, I think the, the the overarching theme to me is just this massive migration to online, uh, and and there's just so much spend in retail. There's so much market to go after that. You know, sure that we want to you know edge out the competitors and and and, and be the number one. Um, you know, we're confident in you know our team, our product, our value proposition uh, that you know we will be enduring. But but certainly you know there are a, a lot of folks out there, and you know given how strong the consumer demand has been. Um, it's, it's not really a surprise that there's so many different players jumping in and, and trying to, you know, capture their fair share of the, uh, the prize. Any idea, Dennis, um, this just kind of came, came to my mind. I, I think about grocery items and I'm assuming that grocery items are probably the most predominant items that you're selling in these facilities. 
And when I think about grocery stores and very, very thin margins, how does the uh, SKU count, in other words, the number of products in a Joker's uh, offering, how does that differ from just say a traditional 40,000 square foot grocery store? Do you have the same offering or is it more akin to like the convenience store like we've been talking about? I'm just yeah. trying to figure out the business model. Yeah, exactly. You know, I think we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, leveraging data to have a very focused assortment. And, you know, given that you need to be within a mile of your customer, there's not a lot of 40,000 square foot, you know, lots in midtown Manhattan. Uh, and if they are, it costs you, you know, both arms and both legs. Uh, and so we really focused on leveraging data to figure out what are the products that we need. So, you know, in three to 4,000 square feet, so it's, a, it's a much smaller footprint and you have a much more tailored assortment. Um, and that means, you know, instead of a grocery store with 30, 40,000 SKUs, you know, we might carry, call it 2,000 SKUs. Uh, and what does that mean? That means that we'll carry the same product breadth, uh, but we might not have the depth. And, and you won't get 16 different options for eggs and, you know, 20 different options for, for that, this product and that product. But by using data, by using consumer insights to figure out what are people actually really need? What do they actually want? Um, we don't have to stock all this inventory that sits on the shelf for four months. Or worse yet, stock all this inventory that sits on the shelf for five days and then goes bad and has to get thrown out. And so by, by having that tail assortment that really turns over, not only can we have a better consumer value proposition, but also we can control the margins on our side and reduce the wastage uh, of, of the inventory loss that we have. Well, guys, uh, I have to. We have to leave it there. We're out of time. That went by super fast. Um, I know I have more questions. We didn't get to all of them, but what are you going to do, <laughs> Dennis? Thank you so much for joining me today. Dennis Levine uh, is VP of Expansion with Joker, and uh, Gino Corradini is uh, with JLL. Thank you guys so much. Thanks so much, Thank James. You know, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Awesome. And for those of you watching at home, uh, do us a favor and tell a friend about the Where We Buy podcast. Let them know they can subscribe to Where We Buy on the iPhone podcast app on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. We're also at wherewebuy.show. And if you're watching right now live and you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. Then you'll be alerted every time we go live. If you're watching on LinkedIn, you should be following JLL Retail. That's the page where we go live every week. If you want more retail and real estate, watch that show, Everything We Know About Retail. We go live every Thursday at noon Eastern, which is nine Pacific. And uh, you can figure out the other math in the middle. Um, Thank you all for joining us today. And as always, our theme music is Run in the Night by the Good Lords under Creative Commons license.